good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever in the world you are. Welcome to a special edition of Live Coding with Salesforce Developers. Here in this room at Forcelandia in Portland, Oregon, I've got probably, what, 50? You guys think 50? Yeah, this portion. We have a live studio audience today, and with me today at my right hand, as my right hand man, or lieutenant, as he might say, is Simon Goodyear. You want to say something? Yeah. yeah. Hi. Pleasure okay. to be here. Simon is the head of Salesforce at Oodle Car Finance, uh, which sounds very uh, managerial, pointy hair boss, not someone who writes code. Yeah, it's a bad title. I do write code, I promise. Okay. Okay. Uh, and I am Kevin Porman, a developer evangelist at Salesforce. So with that said, let's jump into what we're going to talk about today. Um, we're going to talk about uh, how field level security or FLS is not just for field level security anymore. We're going to talk about what the problem domain is we're going to work on today. And then we're going to actually code the solution for the problem domain that we're going to work on today. That's the interesting portion. This is the not interesting portion here while we go through slides. And we've got a... Um, a recap. So let's start with the field level security. Is uh, the FLS is not just for field level security anymore. Uh, this is the forward-looking statement slide. If you've never seen one of these, congratulations. This is your your first time. Uh, the forward-looking statement slide is a reminder that Salesforce is a publicly traded company, and that you, as a purchaser of Salesforce goods and products, should make your purchasing decisions based on things that are actually publicly and generally available. All right. It also reminds me not to make any forward-looking statements which is the FLS there. So with that said, let's dive into talking about things. We're gonna talk about uh, packaging and triggers today. Uh, Simon, have you moved your org to, to various packages? Oh, our org is a mess. We're desperately trying to, and packages is, is where we're going, without a doubt. That's probably not the answer you were expecting. No, no, that's probably, that's about what I expected. I know a lot of people who uh, would, would be honest and say that their org is a bit of a mess and that they're having to move to packaging, um, but they're also experiencing challenges with that. Um, I think packaging is, is probably, I call it the bee's knees, it's the cat's pajamas, the way we're gonna move forward and keeping our orgs clean and easy to update and maintain, uh, but that's not something that we can always do on the turn of a, a hat. Um, I know uh, one one org, they've gotten big enough that they can't actually use one single metadata retrieve call to pull down all their metadata, uh, which is more than 10,000 uh, entries. So they're having to move to packaging because they've hit a physical limitation and that sort of thing, but they're caught up on how to do that. One of the things that they brought to my attention was, well, how do we move triggers? Because triggers are all over my org and they're critical to the business process. And so we have to, we have to find a way to maintain this whole mantra of one trigger per object. How do we do that and not have these cross package dependencies that make it so that if I update one package, I have to update seven others. Um, so we're gonna work on a solution for that today. Um, our trigger best practice that we've been preaching from Salesforce for the, you know as long as I can remember is one trigger per object. You put your logic of the trigger in a handler class instead of in your um, trigger itself. And that uh, this allows for all sorts of things, but order of operations, um, that sort of thing is, is one of the big reasons. Uh, helps with testing, et cetera. Um, this is though the problem because if you have one trigger per object, and especially if you've got one trigger with all the logic in the trigger, then how do you update one package without adjusting the triggers for everything? Have you run into this? Oh, yes, many times. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it hurts to think about it, let alone talk about it. Let's uh, let's pull the audience here. We've got a live studio on, so let's make use of them here. Has anybody else run into this problem? We got we got a few hands. We got a few hands. Okay. Um, are you also moving to packaging? Okay. So there's a a Venn diagram of people who are moving to packaging and people who are having this problem. Uh, so you know, strong indication we're on the money of what to talk about. Um, we're going to talk about how to do this without building dependencies between the packages and how to actually package the actual trigger. So to do that, we're going to uh, work on a trigger framework. And we're going to keep our goals as one trigger per object, uh, independent package updates. So if we update one package, we don't have to update all of the rest of them. And we're going to do this in an elegant, clean way. I'm a, a big fan of code as a, a form of art. So we're going to try and be artistic. Now that might look like a Jackson Pollock, or that might look like a Michelangelo, we'll see at the end of the day. Um, so to do this, we're gonna use a trigger framework. If you've never used a, has anybody used a trigger framework? Yeah, trigger frameworks for the win. Um, and we're gonna use some custom metadata, and we're gonna use metaprogramming. Has anybody done metaprogramming in Apex? Yeah, we got 
much fewer hands on meta programming in Apex, uh, but we're going to work through that one here. So uh, we're going to be working on this project. Um, there's nothing in this repo yet except for a license, but if you want to note this down, you can grab hold of what we built at the end of the day and look at it. Um, also, this webinar is recorded, so you'll be able to go back and find this again um, later. So with that, I'm going to cut off all the people taking pictures of the slide, and we're going to move over to the code. Um, so let me switch screens here, and everybody should be able to see my code. Now, Simon, we're going to start off with uh, an explanation of our trigger handler. Um, this is a trigger handler framework that uh, a friend of ours, Kevin O'Hara, has put together. Um, it's actually four or five years old, and um, I like it. It's a pretty elegant way of doing trigger handlers. Do uh, you want to you want to say anything about it? I, I mean, it's my favorite. It's the, the test of time. It is quite old, but it's it's the one I always go to. I'm so really excited to see that we're going to be using this. It's uh, it's really neat. Great. Uh, so let's let's walk everybody through a little bit about how this works. We're going to actually be modifying this trigger handler so that we can decouple our triggers from the various packages, and then we're going to actually write a couple of triggers showing you that you know you can put them in various packages, etc. We're also going to be doing some writing some unit tests for this. Um, what what do you, Simon is shocked at unit testing. Um, we see where his 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 um, loyalties lie. Um, oh, I'm just so, surprised that you had to actually say that out loud because obviously we'd be writing oh, unit tests. Oh, okay. Well, well played there. So I did. Uh, so this trigger framework is written in such a way that you um, you extend the trigger framework class that is provided this at trigger this excuse me this trigger handler, and then uh, you provide the various uh, methods before insert, before update, before delete, before uh, after insert, et cetera. So if we were to create a simple trigger on this, let's do that. Let's go ahead and create a trigger. Do you want to you want to give us a name for this? Me or the audience? Uh, either one. I was thinking you. Well, I was trying to get them involved, but you know. All right, give me. Let's have a name for the for the uh, trigger we're going to write here. I'm sorry. Say that again. Bodie McBoatface. That's a bold choice. <laughs> I'm going to call it Bodie McBoatface Trigger. Yeah, put that there. And so we're going to, we're creating this here, and we should see the the new little file pop up as soon as our file is created in our org. Yep, there we go. And this is actually posting it as a trigger, which means I just did the wrong thing. So let me uh, let me do that again. I'm going to create a class because with the trigger framework, you're going to be using a class to put your logic in, not an actual trigger. And so I'm going to create a class. We'll do Bodie McBoatface trigger handler. Kevin, we can't see you typing online. Uh, the little command prompt is for some reason not showing up, but the class itself should have just opened. Does that, does that open up? All right. And then here we can actually uh, say extends trigger handler. Now, Simon, you want to give us some, uh, some logic in our trigger? I'm going to mute I'm myself first. Uh, I mean, when, what do we want to do? I, I think we're trying to do things where we insert stuff. Yeah, um, let's, um, how about we capitalize uh, the name of an account? The account name will just yeah, make okay. it all caps. Yeah, all caps. I mean, because we all like caps. shouting about our accounts. Exactly. Yes. Okay. Accounts are special. Let's shout about them. So I'll let you put in, you know, what should we do this after update? Uh, before how insert? About, how about before? Yeah, before insert. Yeah. All right, let's do a before insert trigger. Before insert. Where am I? Oh, there you are. Look at that. That's exciting. Um, well, I need to remember how to extend this. So I, I get to extend the class now, right? So. Um, it's uh, before insert, before update, before, so uh, public, override. Override. Um, and we're going to do a before update. There we go, look. Hey. Now, I'm gonna, yeah, I'm going to switch back to our trigger handler to make sure that we're tying this all together. Our trigger handler is set up as a virtual class, which means we have to provide certain uh, methods in our actual trigger handler. So and so our trigger handler is going to uh, look for this before insert or before update method. And um, th those are the ones it's going to call for us. So we're actually providing what are essentially basically callback methods. So let's put our uh, callback method here in um, our trigger handler. Uh, where did it go? Here we go, trigger handler. And then how do we capitalize these? <sighs> 
I'm guessing just, you know, two uppercase. Over, over the account? Over the account. So we're going to go over the account? Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things that this framework does is it passes in the trigger new as a variable. So we can actually construct this. And I'm going to put a constructor in. So I'll say public. Oh, they, OK. We're having, we're having a bit of a technical difficulty with the microphone in room. Um, so we're going to pause for 20 seconds for a word from our sponsor. And by word from our sponsor, I mean, hello. Welcome to live coding. You know it's live coding because we're having technical difficulties. I mean, I'm just impressed that it's not me that's made the mistake so far. Uh, I mean, never underestimate my ability to create mistakes. Testing, testing, one, two. We're testing the microphone for the room. We've got nothing. OK. One, two, one, two, one, two. One, two. Oh, can they, we got some people saying yes, they can hear it. Some people, there, okay, there we go. Back. All right. So that said, what I was trying to say earlier is I'm going to create a constructor for this class. And to do that, I'm going to say uh, public Bodie McBoat face trigger handler and not take any parameters here. But I do want to take some parameters. Well, I'm going to take a list of account and I'll call this accounts just as a simple thing. And then I'm going to create a, a class variable that is going to be list. Count, we'll call this accounts. Like that. And then I'm just going to take our constructor and let it put the, put the data we're passing in into our okay. class variable. Yeah. So, this accounts equals accounts. Nice and descriptive. Nobody would get confused there. All right. And now we can iterate over our list of accounts. Oh, okay. You want me to do something there? I wouldn't have. I, see, I wouldn't have instantiated that list, by the way, when you declared the variable. Yeah. Well, because you're just going and assigning it anyway, so it's pointless. It's. All right. This is why we do pair programming. We'll just put that you. out there. All right. <laughs> Good. Simon's better at this than I am. <laughs> We've never done this before. Uh, am I going to put all the logic in here? Because yeah. I want to use it in two places. All right. Okay. Well, I'll just put it in. So maybe the helper method? Maybe. Let's just do updates. When we insert it, we, we you know, let's just let's be boring. So uh, I'm not going to use imaginative names. Um, and I guess then we'll just say name equals uh, uppercase. Does that sound good? Yeah. I think that, I mean, do we need to verify that that's actually, I, I don't often uppercase strings <laughs> apex, so I'm not sure that is the actual method name we need to call. I, I, there are definitely people here that's done this, I, I guarantee. Yes. So is this right? Audience poll says. Audience poll says nobody uppercases strings. Nobody does so. this. Really? I, let's, uh, I don't believe them. Can you check this for me then, Doug? Cause... Yeah, so let's, we'll, we'll switch over to Google and we'll say Google but, Apex. Well, this is like not being a developer, right? Yeah. Part of being a developer is your Google skills. Uh, here we go. Good old developer forums. And we'll see what the... Best answer is chosen. It's going to be embarrassing if it's your answer. Two uppercase. Two uppercase. Good call. All right. I've never done that before. I just, I just happened to know. Very nice. Very nice. Okay. So how do we handle the before answer? Well, we could just, you know, be really boring, right, and do this. But do we want to do that really? I mean, that's not really best practices. No. No. Okay. If you, we, made, uh, me, if you we, made me not initialize my variable, I'm going to make you do best practices here. You're so picky. Um, so you'd like a private method down here, would you? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. I'm even going to be like, let's do a little. Well, comments, careful. Helper methods. OK. Who are they helping? Uh, us. Okay. 
And how would you, what would you, what do you want me to do with this method then? Do you want me to literally just iterate over the, the, this accounts? Do you, yeah, I think you literally just abstract that out, pull that out. Yeah, I would just yeah. abstract that. Um, uh, we're going to take, well, we don't need to pass it in, right? Because, uh, That's fighting talk, where I come from. Yeah. So for those who are watching from all over the world, Simon is definitely from the UK. And uh, we, we have some spelling disagreements. I'm going to work around it. There we go. Does, does that help? Very, it's very nice. It's very nice. Is the room happy now? OK. So now we can just call no, our. We can just call this, right? Well, that was exciting. Yeah, so now we have our trigger handler logic all set up. I'm going to actually go into our actual trigger, because remember, I created that trigger. And um, I'm going to call our trigger handler. So voting McVote face trigger handler is going to be on account. And it's before insert and before update. OK, now here, all I'm going to do is I'm going to say new Voting McBoatface trigger handler run. And this is how our trigger framework ties things in. So our trigger framework is set up so that when we create our trigger handler class, if we're extending trigger handler, there's automatically a run method for us. And it's going to go ahead and run the methods uh, contextually appropriate for this trigger. So when we're in a before insert method, a before insert context, it's going to run the before insert method here. And if we switch to a before update, it'll switch over to the before update method. So that's how we use the trigger framework that we're using here. It's nice and clean and everything's set up pretty well. But that still leaves us with a situation where if you got a capitalize uh, names method or capitalized names trigger, and I've got a verify postal code trigger, for instance, um, then we end up in a situation where that logic is controlled by the same thing. So how do we decouple that so that we can package our triggers and our trigger framework independently from actual trigger handlers? Any ideas? Well, I was kind of hoping you were going to tell me, um, if I'm honest. That's fair. That's fair. So what I think we should do is open up our, um, our development org. And I'm going to do that with the command line tool, which I don't think you can actually see. So let me fi fix that for you. And I'm going to open that up, and then I'll do force org open. It's thinking. You can do it. There we go. And I'm going to click this link so it'll open on our demo computer. And Simon, I was thinking that we could use some custom metadata for this. Have you ever played with custom metadata? Yeah, I love custom metadata. Yeah, I do. Yeah, it's handy. Um, but Why would you use custom metadata over like a custom setting? Because I can source control it and deploy it, if nothing else. So you can create custom metadata and then as part of a package, include that custom metadata and data yeah. in your package. In my package. So if we set up our trigger handler to look for custom metadata, we could then, in our packages, include the logic and register that logic to run in the meta custom metadata. OK, that's pretty cool. How about we go ahead and um, we actually like create some custom metadata. So you want to tell me how to do that? I want a year in setup, are you? I would just put custom metadata in there if I was you. So see, thank goodness for the search. It's well, just like creating a, a, a normal less object, right? Realistically, at this point, um, go on then. It's very okay. difficult. To yeah, we got to like turn around and see the big screen. Okay, what should we call Can this? Can we zoom in? Thank you. How's that? Much better. Much better. What should we call our custom metadata here? Well, I'm not asking this lot again. <laughs> <laughs> what, you don't want Bodie McBoatface? Well, I mean, I feel like we should because we started a thing, but um, let's keep going. Let's uh, how about trigger, trigger something, trigger control, trigger uh, whatever you fancy. It's about triggers. We'll call it triggers of awesome. And we'll call the plural triggers of 
of awesomeness. Uh, and we'll just hit, we want to, now, what is this visibility portion here? Oh, this bit. This gets complicated. This is this is all around um, figuring out who can update this stuff, right? Um, we want to let everybody be able to update it, don't we? Yeah, I think we want to be able to see it and set up. So yeah. let's create that. Save. Saving, saving, saving. Okay. So what kinds of fields should we add to this? Oh, um, well, we, there's an awesomeness field, surely. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> let's uh, let's start with like class name of our trigger handle. It's so boring, run. but okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let's call this the class name, and we'll make that you know, two fifty five. Um. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Should be fine. Last name. Um, this should be required, right? Absolutely. It's gonna. Do you think it should be unique? Uh, we wouldn't want to run, we run on multiple triggers, right? Now. So we'll we'll make that unique. Um, and any user with the customized application permission can edit it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So now we've got the that the class name in there. What else should we do? You think maybe like a priority order? An order? Ooh, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I like that. Maintain order that. So let's do a number here. And we'll call this one. That's clearly the level of awesomeness, right? Uh, I was thinking something more descriptive like execution order. Okay. Put it in the help text. Done. Thank you. Uh, do zero. We'll do 18 length. You can have a whole lot of triggers here. And for the... Um, Description. I'm going to. I'm actually using the description. I'm going to say in level of awesomeness. Is there anything else we need to, to put in here? I think it's probably enough for now, isn't it? Yeah, I think Keep that's probably simple. good. Good. So I'm going to put this so that we can update it. There we go. So now we have the custom metadata, and if we wanted to start extending this, how about we actually put in a register our first trigger handler. Okay. I mean, I mean, it would be pointless otherwise. Right. We're, I'm waiting for it to save. Saving. Saving. So, Kevin, while we're waiting for things to save, uh, we have a few questions from the internet. The first one, though, which I think is important to what we're doing right now, is what framework are we basing this off of and why? Because I know you mentioned it briefly, but we want a few more details about why you picked that one. Yeah, that's a great question. And the short and simple answer to that is it's a trigger framework called Trigger Framework because naming things is hard. Uh, it was originally published by Kevin O'Hara and there's a link to it in the trail mix that you'll see a link to at the end. Um, you'll be able to grab that easily from the webinar recording. Uh, so there, there's a link to that. And as to why we chose that one, uh, it's because it's the one that Simon and I use when we write triggers. Uh, we're familiar with it, we like it, we think it's well engineered. I, I mean, I think, you, you could see how easy it was there to, to write trigger. Really simple, really quick. To write trigger handler, we just had to override a couple of methods. So that's why we use it, because it's very, very simple. And we can extend it like we're going to now, right? So, so I'm going to create our first record uh, of a registered trigger, and I'm going to give it a uh, label, a name. The class name is, what did we call that? Bodie McBoatface trigger handler? Bodie McBoat face trigger handler, and do we want what execution order do we want? I think it's very. Zero. I think it's very important that we capitalize name, so definitely zero. Okay, so we'll save that. So now we have a custom metadata type, triggers of awesomeness, and we have a record of that metadata, which is our first uh, first trigger handler, and it's going to call the Bodie McBoat face trigger handler logic. So now we just have to go through and actually wire that in to our actual trigger handler. So let's look at what that looks like in the code. Let me close this here. Here's our trigger handler, and let's look at our trigger handler framework class, and we have this run method. Now, we call that run method in our actual trigger, and it's going to go and run through these saying, you know, if the context is trigger context before insert, then do the before insert method, et cetera. So we need to figure out a way to wire in here a thing that says find our registered 
trigger handlers and somehow instantiate those objects, those classes, I can type. Um, and then call the proper method. Oh, I'm hovering, there we go. Um, call the proper methods on those classes. So here we need to actually like figure out what classes we have registered in our trigger handler. So how do we pull things out of the custom metadata? Stockle. Stockle. Show us. So, oh, ooh. I got to yeah. write triggers of awesomeness. That's quite long, right? Yeah, it's like it's like the scene in the Matrix. I know kung fu. You know, Sockle, show me. <laughs> um, so I was lying basically uh, when I said that I still write code. And you're just trying to trying to prove prove that, right? So I, I mean, go on, carry on. You were going to insult me. Keep, keep go for it. I wouldn't. I wouldn't insult you. Uh, triggers of awesomeness. Here comes the. Dyslexia. I think it's just awesome. Uh, okay, uh, uh, MDT for metadata. Right? Yep, yep, that custom metadata. See, so, yeah, I do remember. So the underscore underscore MDT. If you've never used custom metadata types before, that is the appended flag to tell you that this is a custom metadata type. Um, we need some fields out of this. What for, um, what fields do we have? I can't remember. So we've got uh, our select field. Is we need the um, execution order field. Did, was there a space in there? I really wasn't paying attention. Well, let's let's let's. Can you double check for me? Sorry. So we've got the execution order, and let's uh, let's go back to our custom metadata types. We'll actually look at the fields, triggers of awesome, and then we've got execution underscore order underscore underscore c. Thank you. And class underscore name, name underscore underscore c. Okay. Uh, was it triggers of awesome or just trigger of awesome? Is it? It's triggers of awesome. Triggers of awesome. Okay, so something like that. Would you look that? Would, the, would that satisfy you? Um, yeah, I think we need to let's let's do let's do some like source formatting here. Yeah, there we sure. go. I mean, you know. Um, uh, do you, do you think we should order by? Well, I mean that would be clever. Since we've got the whole execution order thing, we might want to order by the execution order. Uh, I just, I, uh, yeah, I mean, you're right, and I have no excuse. Uh, ascending. Yeah, ascending. Yeah, yeah I think. Okay. So we have the first one. The right first, obviously. Right. Yep. Um, you know somebody's going to come along and put minus one in there as well. I, I mean, probably. Well, I mean, we don't need to worry about that, but somebody yeah. will do it. Yeah. Okay. So now we've got our our actual list of triggers. And we can loop over those, right? Yes. Let's do that. Um, so let's let's say that this is a uh, this is a trigger of awesome, and I'm going to call it uh, trigger. And uh, that's a reserved word. That. Yeah, I'll call it um, I'll call it trigger. Yeah, the Y instead of the I. Call it trigger or trigger. Uh, over our awesomeness. I kind of feel dirty seeing that, but. Okay. Um, and then we need to instantiate a class mm -hmm. from that string name. So how do we go from, you know, first trigger to trigger a Bodhi McQuote based trigger handler as an object we can manipulate? <sighs> mm, bit of introspection. How about, we, we got the type class, haven't we? Can we use that? Um, I don't know. Show me. Uh, I don't know. I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure we can. I can't remember the syntax. I'd have to look it up. Uh, can't we do type dot? Um, For some reason, scrolling is difficult. Um, I can't remember how to do this. It's definitely type. So let's type something. Let's do this. Let's look on. Let's look on ye Google. You've got that over there. I don't have that power that's it's true i can i can do that that's my power um so type from name in apex i even put a question mark there i'm trying to be nice to the googles 
type class. Here we go. So when the Googles take over, I want them to know that I was polite to them. So we can do this instantiating a type based on its name. That sounds like what we want that to do. That sounds perfect. Uh, and they're going to give us this. Um, oh, they're doing get type. Let's see, you type for name. Oh, look at this. Oh, that's perfect. That's exactly what we want to be doing, right? Um, let's see, custom implementation, class property. So we want to pull the type from name. Let's see what the actual. Oh, I'm going to have and to this type Triga. Ugh. <laughs> oh. um, I can't believe you made me do that. So this is going to give us a, a system type variable. It's this is going to give us an type. instance. We want to do dot new instance. Or can we do? Is that how we do yeah, this? I think we can do dot new instance. Let's look at and see if our documentation has. Uh, let's see, new instance. I don't see a new instance method. Second from the bottom. It is second from the bottom. This is what I get for. <laughs> Being quick on the eyes here. All right, so, so cool. uh, and so that's gonna that's gonna return us some stuff. Um, it's gonna be a trigger handler, right? Well, we can cast it to that. Well, we're gonna, yeah, obviously, because it will come back as an object. Because right, we're gonna cast to the virtual class that we extended. Oh, there we go. I didn't just copy and paste that. Not at all. Scroll in, Kevin. You done? Yeah, we're good. Awesome. Could you move your cursor as well? Because like I can't actually see what I'm supposed to be typing. Thank you. That's better. Okay. Call me fussy. I, I wouldn't dream of it. I can't code with my eyes closed. Um, so, so we've got this. We've instantiated it. We've cast it into a trigger handler. We now we would run the trigger, right? Wait, right. before we run it, should we write some test code? Oh, is it? This is the test-driven or tested uh, development yeah. method. Which should we do? I feel as though I feel, I feel as though whatever I say, I'm going to be wrong. <laughs> I, I feel like there's probably distinct camps here, but I'm going to say let's finish the logic and then we'll test it. Personally, that's what I would do, but I feel as though Heather might actually. Oh, there's okay. a question from the internet. Everyone knows that it's like the comments. You don't read the questions from the internet. It's like <laughs> comments on things. Just, yeah. So let's go ahead and finish the logic. Let's just here. finish this first. Okay. Um, we can just do this, right? Yeah, yeah. I think so. Well, well, we should test it, I guess. So if we if we run account if we run the the run method, it's going to rerun this entire thing. Oh. So instead of doing handler dot run, we probably just need to do some copy pasta let's editing. Let's clean that up. Yeah. Yeah, let's, let's do this. Let's do put this up here and format it a little nicer. And then and we need to find a replace on this, the handler, right? Yeah. Yeah, so let's do that. Let's you know, highlight a section. We'll do find and replace. We'll do this with handler. And we'll do it in the selection, I think. You can't see my screen. You can't see that. Oh, yeah. yeah. Technology failure. You can't see that I'm copying and pasting. Let's let's not use the copy paste then, or the uh, find and replace. So let's just uh, you go from the top all the way you, to the bottom. You ready? You can do the yeah. top. Uh, not me. So while you're all, right. all renaming things, we also have a question that um, is asking, what's the best practice to handle error within a trigger? And I know we're, we're currently writing that trigger, so I was wondering if we had any thoughts here. So I think the best practice for handling errors and triggers is don't write triggers with errors. No. <laughs> I call your code. Yeah, who writes errors? Um, no, I think so. That, that's a complicated question, and I think it depends on what your trigger is doing. Um, I'm going to say you should definitely record the error, and that um, that can be done in a number of ways. My favorite trick is to call an at future method with a bunch of string stack trace information and record that in a custom S object, so that I can always go back and run reports on what errors are happening and where. Um, but there, there are, as the saying goes, many ways to skin that cat. Yeah, I would probably fire, fire a platform event because then if the transaction rolls back, you still get it. Oh, 
Oh, well, that's nice. Yeah. yeah. So platform event. Um, maybe we can build that in if we have some extra time. Maybe, but maybe. Let's, let's not let's not get too yeah. excited. Okay. Okay. Right. Curb your enthusiasm. Gotcha. Curbing my. And we did set expectations quite low. That's true. That's true. So we've got. Let's just recap here for everybody following along at home. What we've got going on is in our run method, um, when the trigger is called, so we'll start over in our actual trigger. Our trigger is going to call the run method on a new instance of the handler. So that handler will run, and when the handler runs, this logic will execute. I click on the right thing. It will run the trigger handler logic, and the trigger handler will say, okay, I'm gonna go get all of my registered uh, triggers that have been registered in custom metadata and then for each one of those I'm going to instantiate them from the string name of the class which means that we actually have to spell the class name correctly that's kind of a gotcha yeah that, um, that that's definitely one of those errors that's gonna happen right yeah yeah um, maybe we can clean that up with sometime in the future yeah. um, that's and so future Kevin's problem Future Kevin's problem, great. So we're gonna grab that and then we're going to iterate over each one of those triggers um, and call, instantiate it from the class and then run those appropriate methods there. Does that make sense? Does everyone, everyone got that? Um, great, so how do we go about actually testing this? I don't know. It, I, who writes tests? Sorry. Oh, who writes tests? Oh, Simon. Oh, Simon. Let's create a new class. Uh, we'll do <laughs> Bodie <laughs> McBoatface trigger handler tests. One of these days I'm going to run out of characters. Okay, and we'll just mark this whole thing as at test. No, not is trigger executing, is test. Okay, now we can do that. We don't need a constructor in this one. So first thing we need to do is we need to create a custom metadata type for our our um, class, right? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, so, uh, and we're gonna need an actual implementing, implementing class. class to test with. So, so let's create an inner class that is our implementing okay. class. So public testable trigger handler logic. And oh, we should make that extend. Don't think you really want the brackets there either. Uh, I also can't extend an inner class, can I? Oh no. no. Level. So we're gonna have to do this, we're gonna have to do this as a dunk class. Back here we'll do create apex class. We'll call this one testable trigger handler logic. And I'm just gonna copy and paste what we typed there. Yeah, we got another question. One minute warning. Oh. Okay. I thought we had till the end of the hour, uh, but apparently we're gonna get kicked out of the room in one minute. No. 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 Okay. The person in charge, which Hold by on. the way is uh, is saying. It's just prep for lunch, so we'll be fine. Okay, we'll be fine. We'll be fine. Um, so we're going to, to go here and we're gonna create uh, our class. It's going to implement or extend trigger handler. Extends. Okay, thank you, Simon. I like this. this yeah. Is, yeah. Uh, you can fix my typos. So we've got a class here. It extends it. Let's give it uh, one method. So public override um, before update. Before update. Uh, it's before insert. Okay. Uh, do we need a constructor for this? Might make things easier. <laughs> Trigger handler logic. Um, I don't know what we'll do in our constructor yet, but we can just say. I mean, it um, looks nice. Yeah, I mean, we can. What should our before insert method do here? 
let's just leave it stubbed out for right now. So we'll call that. Now we've got our class that is our test, and we're going to need to create custom metadata. So let's create a um, test setup method. Uh, we'll call it metadata. It's fine. And then how do we create a custom metadata type record in Apex? You're like the oh. Yeah, we can't insert custom metadata types. Uh, that's that's going to make fun. testing interesting. It's going to make it fun. So when we end up at the situation where we can't create some type of custom metadata or metadata in general that we need in the test, what is our um, our last resort annotation that we can call to to fix that? Oh, somebody in the somebody in the room said see somebody all data. Said that? I don't know that I would have admitted that one. Um, should we punish them? Well, I mean, we're, I'm just going to make them write Triga on a whiteboard. Right. Yes. So let's do CL data equals true. That yes. got a groan. That got a groan in the room. CL data equals true. This will allow us to. Oh, I did not know that. Custom metadata is available as a type. So. Oh, so we don't. We don't need to see all data. Dot Yay. <laughs> Yay. And there was much rejoicing. And the room is, there we go. There's Rapid the room. Yeah. This is why, and this is why I love doing live coding because not only is it pair programming, it's also you learn things from other people because we don't always deal with this kind of stuff every day. This is true. Right. Yeah. Like you know, how do you uppercase a string? Uh, I'm scared that I need that. I'm I'm going to never hear the end of how do you uppercase a string on Twitter. I can just see it. Like people are going to be asking me three months from now, Kevin, how do you upper uppercase a string? And and so long as I ask you in all caps. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, so let's let's write our first test method. Let's write a test method that's going to make sure that we see and can pull an object out of custom metadata. Okay. Yeah. You just want to you just want to query some custom metadata. Is that that's quite exciting? Yeah. I don't know why it just gave me, okay. okay. Static void test method. Um, nope, I need to, I don't need this test. So here's our static void test method name. Let's give it a good name. Like, um, can we see the metadatas? Metadatas. Um, what should we run this? Who should we run this test as? I think just the regular just the normal user, user right? That's, yeah, let's not cool. get carried away. Let's not We're get carried away. The clock. That's true. Uh, so here we go. We can um, call our testable trigger handler dot run. And if we do the testable trigger handler dot run, it's going to go pull that information for us. And we should have one already in there. It's hard to write a unit test for this because we want to do just one section, but how do we do that? So let's look at our testable trigger handler logic and the trigger handler itself. We have these methods in here, this list of awesomeness. I'm going to do this. Let's, uh, let's see. No, we can't just make that test visible. I don't know that we can unit test this. We have to like functionally test this. Um, yeah. Let's we can't use, test yeah, it. Yeah. Um, so we're going to run our, our logic here. And uh, oh, we're actually going to, we actually are going to need data. We need to count data, don't we? We do need to count data now. Yep. So count, awesome account, equals new account. And we'll give it a name of not caps. So Kevin, we have a question online. Um, so this whole thing is helping us be ready for packaging. But the question mm -hmm. is, how do we share the metadata among multiple packages? That's, That's a great question. question. Um, we, we can either pause the testing and answer that, or we can keep the testing. What, what do you think would be more valuable, Simon? I think answering the question would be more yeah. valuable. So the, I think the answer is what you do is you end up creating a package that has your trigger handler 
or your trigger handler framework in it, and then you insert your, you have packages with triggers related to that package. So if you've got a billing department package or a shipping department package, that package would contain the, the logic for all of your triggers there, knowing that the trigger handler framework is going to find those out of custom metadata and run them as needed. So we've decoupled what's running uh, by requesting it from the database at runtime. Does that make sense? I'm looking at the room here, I'm asking if that makes sense. The internet can weigh in and say, yes, no, maybe so. No, that's no. the brilliant part. Once you put the custom metadata type itself in the package with the triggers, with the trigger framework, so you have a, a package that is a trigger framework. It includes the custom metadata type. Each of your individual packages can include records of that custom metadata type. But they have to know what numbers are taken in the order of execution, right? So, so I'm having a hard time hearing you, and I'm sure that the internet is too. So let's get a mic over to you here real quick. Okay, go ahead. I was just asking, what are the uh, then the packages have to know what numbers are already in the custom metadata type record, so you don't end up with two ones or two threes or whatever in terms of trigger ordering. I mean, if we solved all the problems, we would work on bigger problems. Um, that's a very good point. You're going to have to negotiate with your business users and use the UI provided in order to, to set up your, your order of operations, but that is a very good point. You're going to have to know what those are. Um, one might suggest that you ship your record without an order of execution in there, since they'll still be picked up, they just won't be sorted. And then after you need to sort them, you can go into the UI and change those manually. That was a great question from the audience here. Do we have any other questions from the internet? Because I know we're running short on time here and I don't want us to, to lose out on any more questions. Okay, so with that, let's. how about we switch back over to our awesome slides and talk about like what we want people to have learned from this. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I'm, I'm hoping they don't learn something. I think I think they will have. Good. Uh, so, I have. You have. Yeah, I now know how to uppercase a string. So, <clears throat> today, we learned how to use a trigger framework, and we learned how to extend that trigger framework so that we can decouple our trigger logic from various packages so that we can have trigger logic in individual packages and have a package that is nothing but the trigger framework and its custom metadata type, which is a seemingly, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna pat myself on the back and say that's an elegant solution. It's a, I think it's a very elegant solution. Very very elegant I am, solution. I'm gonna go and implement this when I get back. Oh, nice. Do you just wanna download the repo? I just have the repo, yeah. Okay. I mean, I'll yeah. make it better, but. Oh, are you gonna open source it? Yeah. All right, all right. Keep a watch on this repo. You might find awesomeness ahead. Um, we also worked so that we can prevent, we do this so that we can prevent these cross object, uh, cross package dependencies. So that one package doesn't require the update of another package, et cetera. We still have a dependency with, we're going to have to have a dependency on the trigger framework being in place before we can put trigger handlers in various packages. But that seems like a easy enough dependency to manage. What do you think? I don't think we can do this without a dependency. Yeah. So let's have this one. It's a it's a good core thing to have, right? It's a it's a loop coupling, but yeah. it's still coupling. Yeah. Okay. Um, and we used custom metadata to store which triggers we want to run and when, and then we use custom meta excuse me we use meta meta programming to I can talk uh, meta programming to switch from the string of our class name in the metadata into an actual object of that class. That was pretty cool. That was really cool. That's like three really cool things right there. I think it's probably my favorite trick in Apex. The, the instantiation. Yeah. Yeah. It was good. Type from name, new instance. Yep. Um, so that's what that's what we did. We want to you to walk away with the idea that packaging is the way to move forward and you should all do packaging. Everyone's doing packaging last week, right? All right. I'm getting nods and like one hand up, but I'm getting lots of nods here in the room. I'm sure everyone on the internet is raising their hands and their coworkers are like, why are you raising your hand? Uh, but now now they, if they watch the video, they'll know. Um, triggers can be really hard to break up, but this is a way to loosely couple our trigger system so that we can easily pass on these triggers uh, into individual packages. Uh, custom metadata can be used for awesome things like knowing what and when to run things which is our, our, our decoupling engine, as it were. 
And then uh, the last one is custom metaprogramming is cool. Like bow ties are cool. All right, uh, so that said, there's a couple things I wanna show you and, and show the internets. Uh, I've put together a trail mix here. This is the link to the trail mix. Again, the link to the trail mix will be in the show notes in the uh, video recording. And if you go to that one, you'll learn all about Apex triggers in general and all about um, different things, including the framework and the repository where we're storing this code that we worked on today. Uh, and you can go and learn all about those things on Trailhead there with this trail mix. I'm going to give you two seconds left to take a picture of it, and then I'm going to switch this over to Q&A. Now, this is mostly for the room, but if any of our internet visitors have questions, feel free to ask them, and our uh, MC, Heather, will tell us what they are. So questions, comments, snide remarks? I'm assuming that should I be waiting? We're, we're waiting on a microphone to go to our first victim. I mean, questioner. All right, here you go. You're I don't good. know where I'm talking. <laughs> <laughs> into that. Oh, into that. Yeah, you're good. Hi. Uh, I'm assuming that the performance uh, is negligible uh, impact, but we are doing a, that means you're doing a, a, a SQL every single time that you're doing a trigger, every time, every time there's a database operation, right? So that's like, do we have feelings about that? So I'm going to read your question so back to you to make sure everyone heard, sure heard it and then I understood it too. And then I understood it too. What is the performance impact the of performance moving impact to of a trigger framework that is also making a SQL query every query. time you run it? Yeah, I think that's a great question. If you think about it, this trigger logic is going to run several times. Every time there's a before insert, then an after insert, and then a after before update. And you know, so you can end up running this theoretically several times every time you save a record or insert a record. Uh, there are some things you could probably do to mitigate that, depending on what your level of risk is about not picking up new trigger handler logic. You could probably put it into um, the the cache. Platform cache. Yeah. Platform cache. Um, you could do something like um, you could use a custom setting where it's not really SQL. You just get the instances. Um, you'd have to sort those on your own that kind of thing. There are many ways to handle it. I think the biggest concern I would have is that um, you would run, you still have the same 10 second clock for the CPU governor, uh, but you're gonna run into that anyway when your triggers are run. We're just changing how they're run. We're adding that, I don't know, what, 20 milliseconds to query it from the database. I don't, I don't really know off the top of my head how long it takes that. Uh, I don't know that this is a solution that would scale to a situation where you've got hundreds of triggers. I would also ask what you're doing if you have hundreds of triggers. Uh, so, I mean, do you have thoughts on that? Uh, I mean, I, I think that, I think what we've got is a great starting point. We definitely have to do some stuff to mitigate it. Um, but I don't think, I think the cost is massively outweighed by the benefits. Yeah. And again, if we, if we could solve all the problems, you know, we'd, we'd solve harder ones. So. That's a great question. Any other questions? We have a question from the internet. Um, so how are we checking for different objects types, like having a trigger on account and contact? Are we able to use the same framework here? Yeah, that's a great, yeah, that's a great question. I think what's going to happen is we've got our original trigger, Bodie McBoatface trigger here, and you'll notice that that's on account. If you have multiple triggers, one per object, you'd also have multiple trigger files. So you'd have a trigger for accounts, you'd have a trigger for contacts, a trigger for opportunities, a trigger for Bodie McBoatface awesomeness underscore underscore C. Um, and each one of those triggers would basically contain something very similar to this. It's going to have a class that runs your trigger. But I think I think what we probably need to do is have something in the custom metadata that tells us what object, because otherwise we're gonna, every different trigger, we're gonna get all the trigger handlers back. Oh, that's a good point. I hadn't thought about that. Yeah. I think that was, so, that was the question. So. so we do need to add a custom metadata field yep. of count of object. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good call. Call. Live coding for the win, eh? What was the extension that you used uh, to collaborate in VS Code? What was, the, what was the, the tool used to collaborate so that we're both typing? Um, it's a plugin for Visual Studio Code called LiveShare. Any other questions from the internet? Yeah, 
standard plugin for VS Code. It's available on all platforms. And as you can tell, uh, for those of you in the room, uh, my esteemed colleague is using a Windows PC and I'm using a Mac. And so you can cross platform it, all that jazz. It's very, very, very cool technology. Hope you enjoyed live coding with Simon Goodyear and Kevin Foreman on uh, decoupling your org with uh, triggers. Thank you. I've, I've enjoyed it. It's been fun. Yeah.